Hello, and welcome into the KE Report. I'm your host, Shad Markwitz, and I'm speaking today with Akiba Leesman, President and CEO of Mako Mining, traded on the TSXV under the ticker MKO, and on the OTCQX under the ticker MAKOF. And Akiba, always great to get you on the show. Happy New Year here in 2024. And we really want to spend today unpacking some of the news that you just released to the market on January 15th. This is the Q4, a record Q4 as far as production and wrapping up the year of 2023. I won't steal your thunder, but it does look like a lot of the metrics are on track for a bang up quarter and a, and a great end of the year. Walk us through the key takeaways from an operational standpoint, from a production standpoint in the Q4 metrics. Yeah. And thanks, Shed, and, and happy new year to you as well. What I often have to tell people is that you, you do need to have a frame of reference for, for what our, our San Albino mine is, is all about. We're a fairly small mine. So when we, we had our, our record production results, we've covered about 11 and a half thousand ounces uh, of gold uh, directly from the plant. And then we also had a couple thousand ounces of gold uh, that was held in inventory over Q3 because of, uh, of, a, of a temporary snafu that we had with a, a third per party refinery. So we wound up actually selling 13,500 ounces of gold for the quarter. Now, 13,500 ounces doesn't sound like a lot in the context of, let's call it mid-tier mining, certainly senior mining in that regard. But the amount of cash flow that was generated from the production, both in terms of gold ounces recovered, as well as the, the 13,500 uh, that we sold for the quarter, uh, was extraordinary. Now, we are limited in what we can actually say prior to, to us having a contemporaneous financial a group of financial statements along with it. But we try to give snippets of what uh, the mine was doing with those 13,500 ounces for the quarter. There was over 7 million US dollars of principal repayment that was paid. It eliminated the balance of the, of the Wexford principal that it was on our, our balance sheet. We started the quarter at about 4.9 million, and then uh, five was, uh, was repaid to Wexford, and the other two uh, was repaid to Sailfish, uh, both the 13,500 ounces of silver that they're due uh, per month, as well as a couple of, uh, of payments that we held over from Q3 uh, as well. So that was over $7 million of principal repayments that were made. On top of that, we reduced our payable balance by another $4 million. So in the context of what the mine is capable of doing on a post-tax basis, you're talking about something that there was $11 million of movement just from a liability reduction standpoint. Our cash balance went up by uh, 800000 US. We repaid another 600000 Canadian in, uh, in share repurchases uh, as well. And then on top of that, you want to look at things from a, let's call it an, an EBITDA perspective uh, or a pre-tax perspective. We paid over uh, around five million dollars in, uh, in royalties and, and, and taxes, and when and we didn't even make any reference to to what our, our normal course sustaining capital was, our, our aggressive exploration program. So on a post-capital pre-exploration dollar perspective, the mine was generating so much cash that you cannot look at something like this as just a, depending on how you count, 11,500 or 13,500 ounce a, a quarter a producer. It was just truly extraordinary what the mine was capable of doing in this three-month period. Yeah, Kiba, it's pretty impressive because when people think about it being, let's say, a smaller producing mine right now, the margins are so fat, though, that it enabled you to do things like paying down the remaining principal to Wexford, throwing some of the money back over to Sailfish to repay that. So basically de-risking the project, paying the royalties and taxes. But like you said, you also still found some capital to invest in exploration and growing the mine. Before we get into some of the growth angle here, also walk us through just how things are going as far as the grade. You have an interesting model in that you have really high grade veins that you're mining, but you're also blending that with above ground stockpiles and you kind of get a diluted grade. Walk us through the grade profile and how that's shaping into the production profile as well. Yeah, sure. So we, we just put out uh, an updated uh, resource, which included uh, the remaining uh, bits of San Albino, uh, as well as maiden resource over at uh, Las Conchitas. I guess we did that, what, in, in October of last year. So it's uh, about as fresh uh, as, as fresh as fresh can be. We have an interesting deposit. So we're very high grade, let's call it a native gold type deposit. And usually when you have like a frame of reference like this, it means you have coarse gold in your deposit, you have a nugget effect, 
this hybrid? Can you actually uh, predict it? Is it that we have a, a unique deposit in that regard? Is that even though um, ninety percent of our, our gold reports to uh, to native gold or uh, or electrum uh, mineralogically, we actually don't really have a nugget effect. Is that uh, if you actually take a look at the distribution of gold assays that we have within our model, it almost looks exactly like a, a log normal distribution, which means you can model it. In fact, even though we do apply capping factors to our, our grade, you don't actually need it uh, if you look at it. it. It's actually unique in, in terms of, of high-grade deposits. And for those that have a hobby of geostatistics, I encourage people to look at our geostatistics. They, they really are uh, about as controlled as you can get. What makes the mine somewhat less predictable and where you actually need to, to do a lot of work. And one of the reasons why our, our resources, uh, published resources, are, are generally on, on the smaller side is that we have a few uh, structural controls of how the, the ore body comes into play, is that we have these, these very long and continuous shears uh, that came from the thrusting of the ground when, uh, when the original orogenic nature of these deposits uh, occurred. And then these these structures, these shears can can last tens of kilometers when all is said and done. And then within these the, these fractures in the ground, you have these veins that develop over time. But our host rock is tends to be friable, so over time there's been movement, and it can wind up having some level of discontinuity uh, in the veins along these these very long structures. So our our deposit is controlled not only by the shears, not only by the vein but also on the, the pockets and pods of these, these structures where the high grade actually is. So modeling it becomes probably the biggest pain in the ass you could possibly imagine. One of the reasons why I think we were probably about seven months uh, delayed on the resource was like having these continuous debates about whether the uh, the geological model was this or that. And then basically the, the, the end of this long story is that, all right, let's just finish what we know and then what we can actually get a, a handle on on the model so we can actually have some confidence on how we're going to be mining this and then we'll come back to to kind of like doing the i don't even want to call it an infill program but kind of like a direct expansion program it's kind of where we left off on on the modeling of this resource now your question about grade uh, consistency is that geostatistically i can't see a difference between las conchitas and san Albino. The average undiluted vein, when you're in these continuous pockets of high grade, wind up being anywhere from 15 to 18 grams, thereabouts. It's, it's the same thing as San Albino. And then in terms of how we apply our mining methods to it, we can control it to 40 centimeters on, on either side of that vein. So it dilutes it down in our, our geological model. Uh, and when we report our, our diluted resources, it's probably somewhere around 11 grams. Now we take that material and we wind up blending it with above grade hanging wall and football zones, some historical stockpiles. So net, 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 we wind up uh, having a, a blended head grade for, for Q4 of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 8.2, 8.3 grams going to the mill. Uh, there was about 14 grams of that diluted vein material. And then uh, there was uh, about four, 4.4 grams of uh, the material that was coming from the, the other stuff on a, about a a high 30% for the former and, uh, and a low 60% for the uh, for the latter of the type of material. And that's how you get your blended head grade of, of the eights. Now, going forward, in terms of what we're looking, like, looking at in the model, I don't see any difference. So it's really just a question about where we are in the mine plan. There's obviously always going to be variability in terms of where we are in the mine plan. But net, 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 you're looking at grades that are going to be relatively consistent over time, kind of in this, let's call it the, the seven to, to eight gram threshold. I think this particular quarter was a little bit higher than uh, than normal, but generally, when uh, when you're dealing with our ore body, you're you're going to be diluting everything on a blended head grade of somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven to eight grams, and I think that's going to be the same at the remainder of San Albino. I think that was the same at Las Conchitas North. I think that was the same at Las Conchitas Central, Las Conchitas South, and then anywhere else in our ore, ore body. I really just don't see any material differences between how the geology behaves whether you're here or there on our ore body, obviously subject to various areas of varying degrees of continuity. Yeah, and you've made that point many times, Akiba, that really everywhere you look, you kind of find the same stuff in this orogenic system. And so as you move the mining towards Las Conchitas South, and you're going to be seeing that same kind of grade profile, just walk people through 
where the growth is going to be coming from, where some of the drilling is going to be coming from around Las Conchitas as you continue to push the envelope there, and how you're setting up the production profile for the balance of 2024. Sure. So we have three priorities for our drill program. Uh, number one is that it's to go after the low-hanging fruit that was left out of the resource. And in fact, between me and, and Steve Ricercelli, our QP, we agreed on very specific language in the, the 43101 and the press release saying, we expect the actual reality to be bigger than the resource. <laughs> we usually don't get a QP to sign off on something like that. But I think we uh, we we kind of both kind of came to the conclusion that the resource that we published was going to be substantially smaller than reality, not just from, from the deposit being open, uh, but also within the contours of the deposit. We were making modeling decisions that inherently were restricting some of the, the grades and the ounces that were coming out. So first priority is to kind of like go after that low-hanging fruit that we know that we left just because we frankly ran out of time in terms of when this, this resource needed to be out. We already started mining Las Conchitas, for God's sakes, for about three months before that resource uh, came out. So you're going to see over the course of the next week or so, the first fruits of that from that that low-hanging fruit. It's, it's not even infill. It's expansion drill programming from, uh, from Las Conchitas. Uh, and you're going to see, oh my God, we have like more super high-grade <laughs> Like it's that uh, that it was just completely left out of the resource. So that's number one. The second priority is to uh, is to go after satellites in our on our project. Uh, so to find out some uh, some new open pit material elsewhere. Third priority and what we're going to be getting uh, much more serious about is the the underground potential for uh, for our operations. Ever since we first got involved with with Mako and its predecessor, there was always this kind of, oh, my God, underground, you have like a 30 degree dip. It's, oh, it's going to be like a impossible. And it, it, that's the biggest, <laughs> it's the biggest bunch of BS. It's like our ground conditions, I would rate as uh, as a B minus so that they're not like the best ground conditions in, in the world. And certainly you're going to have uh, some challenges when you have low angle type ore bodies. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with an undiluted grade in the, in the ore body, in the underground, especially when you're going to be selectively going after some of the higher grade stuff. That's going to be well in excess of uh, 16, 17 grams. So we have block diluted grades in our, our resource of about 12 grams, but that's kind of like everything that's reported to cut off. We're going to be selectively mining it. The, the actual block diluted grades that we have uh, in our ore body is going to be substantially higher than the, the, the 12 grams it will work as a profitable underground mine, but we do need to spend the effort of doing geotechnical work uh, and making sure that we get ready. Now, having said that, at the end of the day, the ore body basically starts at the bottom of the pit, is that the amount of underground development that we need to do in order to access this ore body is nothing. It's going to, I think, geometrically, you kind of want to develop uh, the, the ore body from, from the bottom up. Uh, so it's not like you're going to be scratching the surface from the bottom of the uh, of the pit over here. But at the end of the day, if you're going to be going down 50 meters from surface, you're talking about 500 meters of, of underground development to, to get to the first ore. And that's really doing the full development from the from the bottom up in order to get the good geotechnical controls from uh, from the bottom up approach that we're taking. It is a nothing burger to do that kind of development. It is a four month exercise when we're ready to go. It's not going to be a lot of money to do it. it takes like a three thousand uh, dollars a lateral meter when you're talking about development like this. It's stuff that can easily be funded out of out of cash flow. And then lo and behold, and I've made this comment really going back since 2019. If we can prove the economic viability of the underground instantaneously, the prospectivity of our ore body goes up by an order of magnitude. It goes back to what I said at the beginning of this: is that the fundamental Initial controls that we have in our ore body are these these shears and these thrusts that can last tens of kilometers. So at the end of the day, if we're going to be mining pits that are going down maybe 100 meters from surface, instantaneously you're going to opening up the potential for an underground that's going to wind up uh, being an order of magnitude in terms of uh, of bigger potential than we have from uh, from the open pits. And then it it just opens up opportunities for growth. And then the fourth priority is to do uh, what we started to do last year, which is the, the the regional work. We made a discovery 20 kilometers away from mine. And there's hundreds of showings with over ounce material at surface. We've gotten some workings from artisanals that are there that shows the continuity of the vein. There are going to be many, many, many more open pit opportunities on our ground. 
And with each and every one of them, there's going to be underground opportunities that are going to be an order of magnitude potential larger than those opportunities as well. Yeah, Kiva. So really a kind of a multi-pronged approach here. You're going to be doing the expansion at Las Conchitas. You're going to be doing the potential for underground mining. And like you say, it, it's really a across the board scenario where if you can prove the case for the underground mining and, and under one pit, you can do it under all the pits. And then as far as the regional targets, let's maybe just discuss two of them. We've talked about a couple of these before, but just to remind folks of some of the blue sky upside here on your land package, both Puerto Rios and La Segoviana have had some impressive exploration work done. Maybe just walk people through these two key regional targets that could be the future of Mako mining over time. Yeah, we've spent like a good two and a half years doing very detailed mapping uh, across everything to the north. We've reached really the, the top of our uh, our concessions, which is a good 23 kilometers as the crow flies away from our, our mill right now. And we found quite literally hundreds of uh, of samples that have uh, graded in, in excess of, of an ounce uh, material over dozens and dozens of targets. In the middle of, of last year, uh, we decided to have a, a spot check. It wasn't even like, uh, I think I've told the story to, to Ishad is that I, I just got a little bit like bothered by people saying, oh my God, your resources are so small. What are you going to do after this? What are you going to do after Las Antitas? It's like, we are not limited by targets and, and exploration opportunities, and we can almost have discoveries on demand. And lo and behold, I commissioned a 12-hole program across three prospects that were intended to do, you don't think we can make a discovery, we can make a discovery. And lo and behold, in the third hole, we wound up hitting like a couple meters of uh, 40 gram material over on one of these targets. Now, 12 holes over three targets does not a resource make for us because of all the challenges on how to model this. So one of the things that we need to do is get a better handle on the geometry of, of everything. We have a toehold position on our land holding. So we actually own the surface rights over a large part of Segoviana at this point, and we're going to be expanding those land holdings. And over time, we're going to actually wind up having a, a systematic approach on, on drilling this out. But like I said, this is priority four for us. Like our, our like we, we have like this, this major priority where we're going to wind up having like multi-ounce material that literally was left out of the resource. That's going to be part of our open bit mine plan that's going to be coming out in the next two or three years. That's our top priority is to actually put that in because we actually need to plan around that. Our second priority is to, to actually go and find more of these open bits that we can have more faces and, and more flexibility on how we're mining. Our third priority is actually to find the, the the underground abroad. And then the fourth priority is to follow up on new... I mean, think about how crazy that is, is that we actually wound up hitting like a two meter intercept, a 40 gram material uh, that's situated 20 some odd kilometers from uh, from the mine with with clear geometric controls that we know that we can actually make a mine out of this. And then that becomes our fourth priority. That's kind of what we're talking about, the expiration opportunity. And one of the things that we need to do is be a little bit smarter about our time management is because we're limited by the number of, of geologists that we have on staff. We have, including our senior geologists, 19 uh, that are working for us. There is a limited amount of data that could be processed with them. So things need to be prioritized. We just approved a, a little over a, a US $10 million expiration budget. That budget is similar in the amount of data that's going to be coming out when we had our peak expiration spend of Q3 2022, which is running about $15.5 million a year. The main difference is, is that the workhorse of our drill program is going to be these reverse circulation drills that we have on, on site. That's actually going to be the, the news that will be coming out over the course of next week, be some of these RC holes. And I've said this before, RC is very good at determining whether there's no grade, there's low grade, or there's high grade. But uh, in terms of actually getting to the, the nitty gritty of being able to predict what's going to be coming out, you do need to follow up on this with core as a follow up approach. And then luckily for us, we actually have a very well controlled core body when you're within these these structures and, and pods where so long as you kind of know where the, the, the boundaries of the, of the geology lie, you can wind up making pretty good estimates in terms of grade once you actually follow up uh, on the core. It's how we develop that resource that we, we put out at the end of last year, which was much wider spacing than what we put out on the, the original 2020 resource. But now we kind of know the rules of the game about how our, our geology and our geostatistics work. And we're much smarter and more efficient about how we're going to be going after new discoveries, new areas, new projects, new mines, everything. And then on top of that, we're also looking at external opportunities. Like, like I've, I've been pretty vocal about it really going back for the last year 
is that our intent right now is that we are in one of the stronger positions for a company our size in the market. And we're going to use this as an opportunity for growth from an external perspective as well. So 2024 is going to be a, a pretty eventful year, both in terms of the stuff that we're going to be looking at internally and the stuff that's going to be, be looked at externally. And all of this happens because we have the ability to have a mine that's generating as much cash as we are right now uh, that allows us to have a clean, a pristine balance sheet and be able to go on offense. And I, I've said this before. It was the right decision for this company to go on defense starting in, in October of 22. But as soon as we were able to get the mine to work as designed, it's time to go on offense. Well, Kiba, let's maybe wrap it up with that concept because I have seen some comments to the effect of why are you guys buying back shares if you're still repaying debt? And you know, why did you have to go back to the well in the middle of last year with Sailfish and Wexford again? You know, if the mine's doing so good. But like you say, you were giving yourself some wiggle room and playing defense to make sure you got the mining operations to a point where you could then, as you've just proven in this last quarter, start knocking that debt right back down again and also buying back shares. So maybe just speak to that shifting from defense to offense. Yeah, I mean, specifically for balance sheets. So there was two moments of uh, refinance and then like a, a redrawdown of Wexford. So the, the refinance happened with Sailfish in, uh, what was it? It was March of last year. I think we might've closed it in early May, but we announced it in, in March of last year. That didn't actually bring new capital into the into the company. That was a, a dollar for dollar refinance. And we did this for a few reasons. One, from Mako's perspective, it increased the amount of flexibility that we had is that by taking that, that Wexford uh, principal down to, to a small number, we knew that as soon as the Wexford principal was was repaid, we were going to have all the flexibility in the world to deal with the accrued interest on, on that. And there were some ancillary benefits of, of doing this as well, because it was a silver stream. It highlighted the fact that the Mako doesn't, in fact, produce a bit of, of silver uh, and allowed us to tactically get included into a, a silver index in March of last year. So they're, they're actually one of our, our, our larger minority shareholders as well. So both from a, a flexibility standpoint and a tactical approach, we did that stream with Sailfish. The Wexford drawdown. So we wound up in August. So so Wexford started this debt in, in February of uh, 2020. So right in the middle of the pandemic by giving a, a US $15.15 million loan. Uh, we repaid that loan down to 2.9 million, I guess it was the early part of 2023. And then uh, we were running on fumes. There were there were a few issues with the with the mine that delayed access to Las Conchitas because of, of a permit that got delayed. So our grades were down, our recoveries were down. And then we had this little, let's call it black shark, black swan event that happened in, in August where, where the refinery uh, was basically holding back payment because some of our Dory wasn't uh, up to snuff from a quality perspective. And then it was a, it was a holy you-know-what moment where it was just not safe to run the operations with the cash balance that we had. So we wound up taking uh, an additional $2 million from, I didn't say additional, like we were paid Wexford from 15.15 down to 2.86, but we, then it went from 2.86 to 4.86 million uh, at the beginning of the quarter. We got all these complaints. Oh my God, these Mako guys are clowns. They say that they're profitable, but they had to take money from Wexford. Oh my God, what's going on? But the reality, the reality is it was that that was the prudent thing to do is that uh, just to, to sort out this refinery issue that we told people at the time was temporary. And then within a few weeks, that, that refinery issue was, was resolved. And then lo and behold, this mine generated enough cash flow to wind up paying back $7.1 million of principal and reducing payable balance by over $4 million for the quarter. The amount of capital that we spent on the buyback uh, of last year, it was a little bit more this year as well, was about 600000 Canadian. It was a tiny fraction, single digit percent of the amount of uh, of EBITDA that did, that was generated from the mine in the quarter went to buybacks, but it did have an impact. There were a lot of uh, a lot of shareholders that were frustrated. There were a lot of shareholders that just were frustrated with the, the market in general, uh, and it was a good opportunity to buy them out at the lows. So I think our, our average uh, purchase price was about $2.15 Canadian. Remember, the last time we raised that equity capital over the company was in, in July of 2020, right in the middle of the uh, pandemic, uh, we raised it uh, at uh, the equivalent of, of four dollars a share. So the way that I, I view buybacks is that I think outside of Wexford for that financing, uh, of about three million shares went to minority shareholders outside of, of Wexford. 
I sold that at at four, and I've bought back probably fifteen percent of that over the over the years at half that price. I view that as uh, as a negative interest loan more than anything. Uh, so the buyback is not really there as a capital returns policy per se. It's there as basically a demonstration saying this mine is more profitable than companies that you are familiar with in terms of our snack bracket and size. And if anybody is frustrated or wanting to get out of the stock, be my guest. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, there's a big mama bid that will be able to clean out whatever frustrated shareholders that we had. And over the course of a, of a couple of weeks, we were able to accomplish that. All right, Akiba, we'll wrap it up there. But I, I appreciate you putting some color around the decisions you made. And they proved to be pretty cogent looking at the fourth quarter results, how profitable the mine was, the ability to repay the principal to Wexford, the silver stream to Sailfish to still do some share buybacks and still have for the year $10 million budget for expiration as we move into 2024. And it looks like quarter over quarter, this mine is now up and running full steam ahead at the mill rate right now. And I know that over time, there's even the plans to keep expanding operations there. But we'll wrap it up here for today. Always looking forward to our next conversation, Akiba. And if people like following along with the news at Mako, definitely click on the link below this interview. It takes you over to the company's website, to the news section, so you can follow along as well. And Akiba, keep us posted when more news comes out. We'll get you back on the show and we'll update the market at that time. All right. Sounds good, Chad. As always.